Kingdom parables. As we come to Matthew chapter 13, we've got to realize we're coming to a monumental part of the scriptures. It's, it's astonishing because it's here that Jesus talks to us about the kingdom, his kingdom. It's here that Jesus talks about the age in which you and I live. It's the kingdom parables. Not, he says the kingdom is like, not the kingdom's going to be like, the kingdom is like. So he's talking about the time in which we live. So let's enter it with that thought. Matthew chapter 13 verse 1 says this. That same day, important, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, then he told them many things in parable saying. And I'll finish that verse in just a second. First of all, he says that same day. That's just not in there to fill space. That means something. That same day. What same day? What happened that day? I talked to you last week about it. It was the day when the climax of the Jewish or the house of Israel's rejection came against Jesus. But as I had you looking at it last week also, that it was the climax of his rejection of the house of Israel. He says, your house is going to be left to you desolate. He says, it's going to be better for Sodom than it's going to be for you. He says, this generation is going to experience all of these things. It was that day when it came to the climax where they called Jesus satanic of Beelzebub. And Jesus responded to that with the climax of his rejection of them, saying, you will not be forgiven. You can be forgiven of any sin except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is of the Spirit of God. He is, he is fathered by the Spirit of God. He says, you can be forgiven about anything else, but you cannot be forgiven against the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is, that's not there just to fill space. That's not there just as a doctrine. That's in context with what's happening. He has rejected them. He goes on, and right there he says, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he goes out and he, he goes on and he says this. He says, he says, listen, this generation is going to be like this. It's like a house that's swept and garnished. And the the, the ran away. It's, it's clean. And he comes back, the spirit does, and he, this evil spirit comes back and he finds this house cleaned up. And he not only comes back, but he brings back with him all of his buddies. Seven more were worse than him. And he says, the end of this guy, the end of the situation is worse than the beginning. He says, that's how it's going to be on this wicked generation. So, how cool is that? Matthew, and then he goes to a house. And there his parents, well, his, his mom and his, his, his brothers and sisters kind of try to find him. And, and he says, who is, who are my mother, my sisters, my brothers, who, who are they? These that do the will of my father. Then he walks out and he walks down the beach. And here comes this crowd. And they press on him. Now, you have to realize that Jesus is popular both negatively and positively, Correct. He drew a crowd. He was fascinating. He fascinated people. He, he stirred the curiosity up about people. And they would come from all over just to see him, hear him, follow him around for days. And the large crowd came. And uh, he began to talk to them in parables, and they didn't understand the thing he was talking about. They came. They pressed in. You have to realize uh, that in that day, they had no television. They had nothing that we would call entertaining and so, hey, this guy Jesus is down there at the lake. Let's go hear him. <laughs> and you've got to realize if you have access to somebody like that who can heal any disease there is, who can uh, turn water into wine, who can walk on water, who can take fish and bread and multiply it and feed thousands of people, who can speak and teach the way Jesus could speak and teach and astonish people, you've got to realize, man, that's an attraction. And these people came to hear him talk and what Jesus did is sit down in a boat and tell them stories and it says he's walking down the beach and there's a you know, he, he, the, the crowd is so big so large that he gets into this boat now what had happened is these fishermen had beached their little boat fishing boat pulled it up on shore until they were ready to go fishing again well there was one right there so Jesus steps into it and quite possibly the disciples wade out about waist deep and hold the boat so that it won't wiggle and drift and and they hold it, and he begins to tell them parables. <laughs> and it makes an emphasis on this, and it says that only in parables did he speak. 
He told them nothing other but parables. Let me read this to you. Matthew 13, 3 says this, and he told them many things in parables. Matthew 13, 34 says this, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything. He explained nothing to them without using a parable. What's a parable? Let me show you. Let me show you the definition. Probably it means a similitude. It's a fictitious narrative. It's not even true. It's a fictitious narrative of a common life conveying a moral. And all these people came to see Jesus from all over. This big crowd came, hot sun, beach flies. You know, they're sitting out there. And Jesus sits down and that's all he tells them are these stories about dirt and seed. He tells them stories about rocks and thorns, about mustard seeds. He tells, them, he tells them stories about yeast and leaven and a treasure that was hidden in a field and a pearl uh, that was of great price. He tells them about a fishnet and fish. <laughs> he tells them about things they already know about. He didn't tell them anything that wasn't familiar to them. But he only spoke in parables. Now, here's the thing that I want us to get here is that Jesus has rejected these people. And as we saw last time, this was the fulfillment of scriptures. His intention was that they would not get it because if they got it, he would have to heal them. We, we talked about that. I don't, can't get back into all that. If you weren't here, I'm sorry. He didn't want to forgive them. So he's, he's telling them these, these, things, these things in parables and he's telling them things that they already know about. They've come this far to hear him and he's not explaining them. And this is the first time that Jesus actually spoke in parables. Now, I know that's hard to understand. But what, up until this day, he spoke clearly to everybody. Up until this day, he explained things. He, he talked about light. He talked about salt. He talked about, talked about not casting your pearls before swine. He used similitudes. He used um, things that they could understand and relate with. He used manners of speech to, to convey his thoughts. But he would always explain it. But this day, he only spoke in parables. He didn't explain a thing to them. And he would say this. Do you get it? If you don't get it, I'm sorry. In other words, he that hath ears, let him hear. <laughs> so, as we come, we've got to have all of this in our heads and our minds as we approach this passage. And every parable that Jesus spoke was so filled with truth, profound truth. And I can't tell you how many times I have taught this parable that I will teach again today. I, I don't know, but every time I have, I've always seen something deeper, something richer in it. But I can never teach it without making sure we see this, because this parable is a key to all parables. Jesus says, that we, well, Mark is a synoptic gospel. Mark's gospel writes about the same things that Matthew writes about, but from Mark's perspective. And so Mark writes in his gospel that after Jesus had told all the parables, that the disciples got him alone. They came to him and they said, okay, we didn't get it. They didn't get it. We got it. We don't, we're not supposed to, but, but will you please explain it to us? You know, will, will you help us understand this? And so then Jesus says this in Mark 4.13. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then? How then will you understand any parable? There's something about this parable that's a key to all parables. There's something about this one you need to hear so that you can understand the rest of them. There's something about this that tells us about life in a way that we won't get unless we get this parable. So let's get started. Matthew 13, 3. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. Yeah, so. How many times have these people... Being an agricultural type of a people, seeing people sowing seed. How many of you have ever seen somebody sow seed? Right? Duh. And so he says, okay, big deal. <laughs> now understand what happens, and I know that you do, that you know you have a container of some sort. I use a bucket, but there's also the, the sacks that you can hang on your side and you fill it up with seed. And the lot, the plot would be ready, prepared for, for sowing. It would have been plowed and turned and so the sower goes to his plot, his field, and he begins walking at the one side of it, 
next to the path and he begins to reach into his bag or into his bucket and handful at the time he begins to walk and sow seed, handful at the time, uh, scattering his seed. And then he would reach to the end of, the, of his plot. He would turn, come parallel back down beside where he had just gone, uh, doing the same thing. Handful of the time, casting seed. Reach the end again, turn parallel and go back again until the entire plot or field was sowed. And so, he, uh, they, I mean, this was very familiar to the people. It may have even had someone right there around them that he pointed to and said, Behold, the sower goes forth to sow the seed. It was that obvious to the people and that familiar to the people. It was something they had all seen and something that was happening in all of their lives. And so, big deal. So it goes forth to sow the seed. But then he says there's four kinds of soil. Now, I want to make sure I make this clear and hit it a couple of times to make sure we get it. All the soil was the same. What was different was what had influenced the soil, what, what was in the soil, what made it different. All the soil was the same. So it's not this, this four kinds of soil. There's four different influences on the soil. Just want to make sure I say that. Now, let's read about the first soil that Jesus spoke about in uh, verse 4. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. And then he went right on to his next point of the, next, of the, of the same parable. <laughs> not explaining it. Not getting into it at all. He just keeps on talking to them. And, and, so, and so what happens is the, as the guy sows his seed, there's paths. Uh, there, these paths are, are, of course, used by the sower to approach his own little field, his own plot, probably about the size of this room, maybe. You know, a big garden kind of area. It was for his household. And, and so as he would approach his, his field, he would have a path. But not only was the path for him to approach, it was for travelers, and it also served as borders for the next field. Right next door would be somebody, someone else's field, and that path would be a border. And that border has probably been there for years and decades and maybe centuries, you know, had divided these two plots, these two families, and, and so this was divided here. And that's what the path does. That's what the path is. And as he sowed his seed, some of it fell on that hard, walking, trodden path that had not been plowed or, or cultivated for uh, hundreds of years, perhaps. And that's where it fell. And immediately the birds came and ate it up. And so Jesus moves on to his next thought. Next point is that there's another soil. The second type of a soil he talks about in verse 7. No, verse 6. Some, of a, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It had soil. It wasn't just this big boulder laying there. It sprang up quickly because, here's why it sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. The seed could germinate and all the, all the effort, all the germination strength went up because it couldn't go down, because it was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Now, this was something every single person listening to him was well aware of. But he doesn't explain it. It's just a parable. It's just a riddle. And he moves on. He tells his next point. The third type of soil was full of thorns. Matthew 13, 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up. The thorns weren't there when he sowed it. He had cut them down or maybe rooted some of them up, but they were still there in root form or seed form, and the thorns grew up and choked the plants. Thorns took the resources. Thorns took the water. Thorns took the nutrients. Thorns took away the, uh, the sunshine and choked the little tiny plants, and they were unproductive. He moves on. He doesn't explain it. Nothing has been said yet by this profound teacher, this person so availed with words and able to relay and communicate. And he's telling them something that every single one of them already knew. And the fourth soil, verse 8, still other seed fell on good soil. What made it good? Where it produced a crop. It's good when it produces. That's the difference. It produced 160 and 30 times itself. One seed one made 100 seeds. 60, one seed made 60 seeds. And one seed made 30 seeds. He who has ears, let him hear. And then he went right into his next parable. 
He didn't explain it. He didn't give the depths of what he meant. How, how would you feel? You, you want to go and you want to hear this. Astonishing. You got off work. You go and you're sitting out in the sun. And man, you want to hear this guy talk and teach and preach. And you want to hear some revelatory thing. Uh, you want to get something that you can go out of there with and change your life. And he tells you a story about somebody throwing seed. How do you feel? A little disappointed? And Jesus ends it up. If you get it, get it. If you don't, I'm sorry. And he goes on. And he starts talking about weeds and tares in a field. And I mean, and the people are thinking, what, what is this? I got off, I shaved my legs for this. <laughs> That's not in your notes. That probably shouldn't be recorded, but you get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's uh, get back on track here. And, and as, as we said, the disciples came to Jesus later and said, okay, we didn't get it, they didn't get it, tell us what it means. Tell us what it means. And so Jesus gives the interpretation of what he just said. How many is ready for the interpretation? See what he said. Here's what it is. Verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. I mean, he's listening. Are you listening to me? What's that, what's that next word? When? When what? When? Anyone. anyone. I'm an anyone. You're an anyone. No one's immune to this. When anyone hears what? You have got to read that back to me. Here's what? Here's what? And then what? And does not? And does not understand it. All right, take the screen down just for a second, please. Let me talk to you a second. How many of you understand the message about the kingdom? How many people that go to church nearly every Sunday has ever been taught and told about the message of the kingdom? How many people do you know that understands the message about the kingdom? And see, what we do, what we think we know, we push off into some distant time after a rapture, after a great tribulation and some millennial reign. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is like. And he says that this is the person who has heard, but it doesn't understand. Let's read on. When anyone hears the message of the, about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, who is that? Who is the evil one? The evil one comes and what? Snatches, that's harpazo, that's a violent word. Snatches away that was sown in his heart. What is the heart now in the parable? The soil, right? You got it? The seed is the message. The heart, the soil is the heart. When it's sown into the heart, this is the seed sown along the path. If you tell most Christians, especially preachers, about the message about the kingdom, they get hard. They get hard. They get hard and they resist it. And they have no idea that the enemy has just come, that the evil one has just come, that the devil has just come and removed the precious message about the kingdom of God from them. Don't let him do that to you today. I, uh, um, I, 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 I always get resistance when I talk about the kingdom. It gets hard. And, and when I've been invited to go to conferences down to Haiti or Trinidad or, 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 or not long ago, I was invited up to go and preach at a kingdom conference right around here. And I thought that the, 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 plow, the place had been plowed. I thought that, you know, that they were prepared. <laughs> it wasn't. There was more path than it was good soil or period. It was, it was, there was resistance. And, and so when I hit this, and I'm going to hit it now because I want to make sure that we are, get something out of it, 
I always cause earthquakes. <laughs> they need to be shook, you know. There needs to be a shaking happening. So as I was talking to these people, and I was sensing this resistance, I said, well, let's do an earthquake. Maybe that'll loosen it up a little bit. And so I said this. I said, you do know, don't you, that the word Antichrist is not found in the book of Revelation. And somebody sitting out there said, what? <laughs> I said, that's right. It's not, a re- it's not a revelation about Antichrist. The first five words of the book of Revelation say the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I say, you do know, don't you, that Antichrist is not something that's going to come one day. Antichrist is here 2,000 years ago. And there wasn't just one. There's a bunch of them. What? And, And if I'm prepared, and I am today, if I'm prepared, I show them. So let me show you. 1 John chapter 2, 18. Dear children, this is what? This is the last hour. What does that mean? The last hour was 2,000 years ago. The last day, the last time, we're down to minutes now. The last hour, we're down now to minutes. 2,000 years ago. The last hour. This is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, how many has heard that? How many has heard? Come on, get your hands up. How many have heard that Antichrist is coming? You've heard it. But, but, But John says... As you've heard that, even now, read it, even now what? Many antichrists have come. (laughs) This is how we know it's the last time. We're waiting on something that's already happened. We form our doctrine. You see, those people form that doctrine on a great tribulation. And you take their great tribulation away from them, they ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> so, uh, uh, how many, uh, a little earthquake? Huh? And so, maybe I'm not done yet, and so I'm going to hit them with one more, maybe. <laughs> a little tremor, you know. Uh, I say, you you do know that there is no battle of Armageddon. What? There's no battle of Armageddon talked about in the Bible. Oh, it's mentioned in Revelation 16. 16. It says, they gathered at a place called Armageddon. But that's not where the battle was. It's a place. And here's what's amazing is there's no place on this planet called Armageddon. Uh, just along that line. Now, just uh, all of this I get into, I don't just earthquake it. I try to explain it in some of this stuff. So some of this might be helpful for somebody who really wants to get rooted. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So, <laughs> why do I do that? Why do I cause earthquakes? So that... Maybe they'll get something. Maybe they'll realize that there's something they haven't seen before. And that all they have done is listen to a preacher and not read the word of God for themselves. They have not researched it out for themselves. And you've got to read it for yourself. Don't listen to just me. Don't listen to just any. Read it for Let the spirit of God teach you. That's what he's here to do. All right. Soil is soil is soil. Dirt is dirt is dirt. Now what am I talking about here? What, what, what do I mean? What do I mean? Well... It's all the same soil. The soil that was making up the pathway was the same soil that was in the good soil. The same soil that was covering the rocks was the same soil that was in the good soil. The same soil that was in the thorns was the same soil that was in the good soil. The soil is the same. Soil is soil is soil. What was different about each one was what influenced the soil, what was in the soil. Packing the doctrines of men had packed that, or maybe sin had packed that heart. So that it could not receive. Uh, What was influencing in the next one that we're going to be talking about are the rocks. It's influencing. It's in in that soil. Are the thorns that are in that. That's what caused the soil not to be productive. But the soil was soil. And what am I talking about here? Well, the, the message is the kingdom. That's the seed that goes forth. But the soil is the heart. And all hearts can receive. 
if all hearts are good. If all hearts are, are cultivated and plowed, if all hearts are, are taken time and the rocks removed, if all hearts have the thorns gathered out of them, then all hearts can be good. How's your heart? What's influencing your heart? Because we're going to find ourselves in one of these soils. Jesus said there that the evil one comes and snatches away. Snatches away, harpazo, violently. There's, these people get violent with you <laughs> when you start messing with their great tribulation, and rapture, and um, kingdom to come. They get violent. They, they, they don't like it, and they, they don't understand what's going on. And the, the message doesn't have a chance. They won't research it. They won't plow a little bit. They won't look it up to see what you're telling them is true or not. And they have no clue that the devil has just come and taken away that precious message that Jesus gave his life to bring us. So the first soil is a hard heart toward the message of the kingdom, which is caused by doctrines of men packing and packing, or by sin packing and packing a heart that keeps the word, the gospel of the kingdom out and never becomes productive. Paul talks about how, how a heart can be seared as with a hot iron. It, it just will not get the word. It won't receive it. So how's your heart? Is there doctrines of men that have packed it? Or is sin so predominant in your life that you will not give God a chance? That was the first soil. Second soil. Verse 20, Jesus interpreted, he said, the one who received the seed, he did what now? He got it. He, 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 he received it. Received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word. Now notice that it's not only the message of the kingdom now, it's the word. It's been expanded. At the end of the parables, Jesus says this, that we've got to be like, like a, a wise guy who, who takes treasures and puts it in a, both old and new and then brings these old and new out. The old covenant, the new covenant is what Jesus is referencing here. We've got to be like that. We, we get the word, but we're also able to, to hear it and bring, bring it out. And at once receives it with joy. How do they receive it? With joy. Woo, that's good. <laughs> but since he has no root, they didn't research it, didn't dig it, didn't, didn't find out, didn't dig deep to find out if these things be so, has no root, he lasts only a short time. And then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, quickly falls away. Now, the soil, the, the seed, as we said earlier, sprang up quickly. Because there was, they had, it couldn't develop roots. It was all emotional. It was all outward. Woo! Oh, brother, that is good stuff. I've never heard it like that before. I always wondered what that meant. Wow, that makes sense now. Woo! I got it now. Or maybe somebody gets saved. They come to the Lord and they have emotions. They cry, they weep, but it's all external. Because they never dug deep. They never read the word for themselves. They never researched it out. And it's all upward, all outward, nothing down deep. It sprang up quickly, but since there's no root there, as soon as things get hot, persecution comes. Personal persecution, persecution in the church. What do they do? Fall away. Fall away. They got it, they got it with joy. When a little persecution comes, and we see that so much here. Oh, this is best. This is the best thing since sliced bread. Man, this praise and worship, you guys do a great job here. Oh, brother, you're teaching. It's just, it's just the greatest. It's the best around. And then in three months, where, where, where'd they go? If, if it was so good, what happened? Well, they didn't have any roots. And a little persecution comes. Church gets persecuted. They get persecuted, whatever. Don't want to do the word. Fall away. And over the years, I, this has happened to me so much. People get it with joy. I spend my time discipling people. I baptize them. I teach them. Where'd they go? <laughs> you know, 
And it helps me, though. It helps me because over the years, there's been so many people that's come through LifeGate. So many. And it's interesting because you never know until persecution comes if they're really rooted. You, you never know. They look good. Woo! They grow and they spring up quickly. But you never know until the sun comes out and it gets hot whether they really got it. And here's what I want to say to you in challenging you concerning it is how deep can you grow? Listen to me. Not how deep can you go. I don't care how much scripture you know. I don't care how much you can quote. I don't care if you know the kingdom of God from inside outside. It's not how much you know. It's how much you grow. How deep can you grow? Next soil, Matthew 13, 22. <laughs> this is, uh, 13, I know it's a little fast, but it's not that fast. Okay, 13, 22. The one who received the seed that fell along the thorns is the man who hears the word, got it again, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, <laughs> making it unfruitful. Okay, they get it. They start growing again. But now these thorns, these thorns, they are more interested in what the world can give them than what the word can give them and what the kingdom can provide for them. The, the house, the cars, the wardrobe, the, the family, the sports, the events, the, all these things, they, they take precedence. And Jesus said that these things are so deceitful, the deceitfulness of wealth deceitfulness of riches. So they promise what they can't give. They promise security. They promise all this stuff, but they can't give it. Paul said, Paul said this, it's, it's, it's the, the, the love of money is the what? The what? The root. The, it's the root of the, of, the, of the thorn. It's the root of all kind of evil. Jesus says you just can't tolerate both. You can't, you can't handle Loving God and loving money or mammon. You can't do it. You, you're going to hate one and love the other. Or you're going to despise one and, 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 and resist the other. You know, you, you, just, you just can't handle it. You can't tolerate it. Remember, the soil is good. It's all good soil. It's what's in the soil. And here, I want you to hear this. It's, it's what's in the soil. It's what's influenced the soil that's made it unproductive. And, and you've got to get this part. Where do you usually, where would you look for rocks? Would you look for rocks like in soil, in dirt? Is that a good place to find rocks? Yeah, it's a good place. <laughs> my backyard, my yard is only that far and there's nothing but rock. If I want a rock, just dig a little ways and I got one. Rocks. Rocks are indigenous to soil. They're supposed to be there. <laughs> They're There. When you dig up a rock in soil, you don't think anything about it. Well, just here it is. Thorns grow in soil, right? That's where they're supposed to be. That's their native environment. So that's where you would look for thorns. That's where you would look for rocks. But what's foreign now to the soil is the message about the kingdom. What's foreign in the heart is the message about the kingdom, is the word of God. And for, your, for the word of God to have a chance in your life without it being choked out, without it, get, so if it has a chance to dig root, to, to grow roots, then you've got to plow the soil. You have got to get the rocks out. You have got to get the thorns out. If you're going to have any kind of hope to have a productive life, a life that really means something, a life that is 100 times better than you could have had, or 60 times better than you could have had, or 30 times better than you could have had. We've all seen people with thorny soil, and most of us have been thorny soil at one time, if not now. And, and, and we do. We get carried away with these things. So I've got to ask you, how's your soil? Meaning, how's your heart? Where are riches in your life? Are they more important than the Word? How deep can you grow? Not how deep can you go. Because 
If these things aren't taken care of, then you'll never be good soil, which is the next one that Jesus talks about, Matthew 13, 23. But the one who received the seed, now that's the same thing that the thorny and the stony did. They, all of it received it. That fell on the good soil is the man who hears. They did that too. Hears the word and understands it. That still doesn't make it good. You can still tell me all about the kingdom, quote scriptures, know and understand how the kingdom works. But until this happens, understands it, he produces a crop. Until the life produces a crop. Until there is some fruit. Jesus says you know them by their fruit. Until there is some crop, you just don't know if it's really taking place. He produces a crop yielding a hundred times or sixty times or thirty times what was sown. Now, initially, I want to make sure you get it. The, the thing that separated was that it produced a crop. Mark chapter 4 verse 20 says this. Others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, same thing, and produce a crop. That's what separated. That's what made it different. Thirty, sixty, even a hundred times what was sown. Luke 8, 15 says the same thing. But the seed of God of good soil stands on those with, stands for those with a noble and good heart. I can't help but remind you what Bereans were. They said that those at Berean were more noble than those at Thessalonica for, for, because they studied these things to see if they be so. I challenge you to study these things to see if they be so. Be noble in your heart. Noble and good heart for who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. They produced the word. They produced people in the kingdom. They, they, they produced a life that was good. They removed the rocks. They plowed the pathway soil. They got out the thorns. And now they have a life that is 30 or 60 or 100 times better than the life they could have had. Now, Jesus is the sower. We all understand that. But I'm a sower, but so are you a sower. And we all meet people every day that are pathway, that are rocky, that are thorny people. But we also meet people every single day of our lives who are good soil. They're good soil. They're all around us. They've gotten out these things, and they will go ahead and get these things out. And they, they make the kingdom a priority. And this is the kind of people that keeps me doing what I do. This is not the only thing I can do. But the good soil is what keeps me doing what I do right now. I've known many of you for decades. And I've watched your life. When I first started teaching this stuff, pathway, man. <laughs> or, or somebody, woo, that's pretty good, but I don't know how deep I'm going to go in this. Or maybe, you know, deceitfulness of riches and the cares of the world. You weren't faithful. You weren't here. But you begin to deal with all of these things. And you begin to plow. And, and, and you begin to cultivate. And you begin to get the rocks out. And, the, and, the, and, the, and all the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches. You begin to deal with all of these things. And now you give, give, give. You're here. You're regular. You, you still contribute. And you produce now. And I want to tell you this. You're, you're going to go to heaven when you die. No doubt. You're, you're, you have salvation. But I want, to know, I want to tell you this, is that I've watched your lives get 30 times better and 60 times better and 100 times better than they were when I met you. Yes. Yes. And here's what I want you to hear, is you are now living in the kingdom. Let me, let me put it in other kind of words. You are now living a divine life. In conclusion, for today, I'm going to give you three thoughts. Number one, sow seed. I, I, you know, he said the farmer went forth, not the preacher went forth. Right? We can all sow seed. See, the issue is the condition of the soil, not the talent of the sower. <laughs> Anybody, right? Anybody can grab a handful of seed. It's not the talent. You don't have to have a lot of talent to do that. It's the soil, not the seed. And the more you sow, the more chance you get that somebody's going to get it. 
I've sown it and sown it and sown it in you. And some of you have got it now. So sow it. Number two, if you've already sowed a field, sow it again. God's always sending earthquakes. Am I right? In the natural, so it be in the spiritual. God's always sending earthquakes into people's lives. It'll break up some of that stuff. It'll break up sin. It'll break up that pathway of doctrine that's packed and padded and, and built up. It'll break it up. So it again. It'll, 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 it'll dynamite roots out. He'll dynamite rocks out. That's what I meant. He'll dynamite the rocks out. God's always dynamiting. <laughs> and he's always yanking those roots out of our lives. And showing us they're just not what they promised us they were going to be. So go back and sow it again. Because God's probably done something in that life. And see if it's productive this time. And then number three, and this is the one that's for most of us or all of us. Where is your heart right now? What type of soil are you? You're one of these four. One of these four. I pray you're good soil. But if you're kind of like me, you could probably relate to all four of these. There's part of you that's pretty hard. There's part of you that's kind of shallow. There's part of you that's still got a lot of cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. There's a part of you, though, that is good soil. So what do you need to do? What part of your plot do you need to work in? Which is, right now, the major place where you need to work? Do you need to get the deceitfulness of riches out? Do you need to, to get the, dig deep and so you can get rooted in this thing? Or are you so hard and packed with sin or, 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 or just doctrine? Where do you need to work? And I want to end this thing with what Jesus said. He that has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's so good. <laughs> um, thank you for having Jesus explain this so we can get it. That we have ears to hear. So, Father, I pray now that each one of us have heard it today and we know where our lives needs to work so that we can have a 30 times better life than we could have had or a 60 times better life than we could have had or a 100 times better life than we could have had. Heads bowed and eyes closed. How many of you would say along with me that, yeah, I'm kind of like that. I got areas of all of those in me. I'm not all good soil. I'm not all hard, though. I'm, I'm not all deceitfulness of riches and wealth and all that stuff, but I'm, neither am I, you know, there's some places I need to dig a little deeper. How many of you along with me would say, yeah, that's, that's kind of me, and uh, I really would like for you to pray for me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? <laughs> yeah, I think that's about 100%. Father, thank you. Lord, we're, we're admitting it. We get this parable. We got it. We got it. We have ears to hear. And so, Lord, we're going to do what's necessary. If I ask you now by your spirit to do some plowing in the hard places and do some dynamiting in the stony places and do some ripping up of those thorns in our thorny places. But, Father, that our good soil will be sowed and receive the seed and that we'll go forth sowing it. And Father, I ask you to bless us now. Head still bowed, eyes still closed. Now, some of you are just far from God and the reason you're far from God is not because of doctrines. The reason you're far from God is because of sin and it's packed your heart and you've had a hard time receiving anything from God because sin has seared your conscience. And it's just hard right now toward God, toward the things of God. People's let you down. People have hurt you, wounded you. And I ask you, would you let me pray for you right where you're sitting? That God will draw you in again and make you soft again. So that he can seed you again. So that your life can be productive again. If that's you. You just know you're not where you need to be with God. Whether you've ever received him or not, you just know you're not where you need to be with God. Would you, right now, where you're sitting, raise your hand and let me pray for you. See a hand there? Any others? See a hand there? A hand there? Three, four, five. 